Hello and welcome, everybody. It's great to be here again. I'm your host, Ben Martinek, and I'm joined today with uh, one of the best members in the network. Just love this guy, Charlie Horanzi. Did I say that right, Charlie? It's Har Horanzi, right? That's yeah, correct. Let yep, me know. Got it. I got it. Okay, I'm close. Okay. Got the pronunciation is, is uh, hey, gold star. I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. No, Charlie's joining us again. He's been on the podcast before and he's a long-standing uh, member within the Catholic Financial Planners Network. Uh, but we're here today to discuss a super important, very relevant, and, and deeply entertaining topic. Uh, all that just gets us excited, at least every day, and get us out of bed to talk about it's taxes. You know, income taxes in particular. There's a whole bunch of different types of taxes, but we're going to talk about uh, income taxes. Uh, but before we get into the subject matter, we always like to introduce our guest a little bit and just uh, have uh, Charlie say a little bit about himself and introduce him back to the to the show. Charlie, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and where you're from and what you like to do? Yeah, yeah. My name is Charlie Haranzi, and I am the owner and lead financial planner of Focused Up Financial. Uh, we are in Chicagoland, Illinois, and we are virtual, so we work with everyone all over the nation. Uh, what we like to do is find the intersection between planning and taxes. Because today with Ben, we'll talk about taxes, particularly that you will be paying the most in taxes if you don't properly plan. So over the course of the your rest of your life, what we try to do at Focus Up Financial is make sure that your tax bill is the smallest over your life. Not just one year, but Uncle Sam gets the smallest share of your wealth over the whole course of your life. Hey, what, what, what's not to love about that, Charlie? And I think that's just a great segue into uh, into the topic. Yeah, I mean, taxes, let's be honest a little bit. It's not always the most exciting stuff, subject matter to talk about, but it is important and it's relevant. And taxes, you know, whether we like it or not, tend to be the largest or one of the largest expenses we have as part of our finances. And so it, it really is, it just makes sense that with it being such a big expense, uh, that if we can do whatever we can to reduce that tax bill, even if it's just by a few percentage points. Uh, and as Charlie's been you know, hinting at over the course of your lifetime, if we can just do it by a few percentage points, it really starts to add up and, and become a meaningful impact. In fact, I, I really have a, am of the opinion that uh, most financial planning, as we like to call it, really is just tax planning. Uh, you know, There are other considerations outside of taxes, and perhaps Charlie and I are just a little slighted or biased on this since we do <laughs> primarily work in tax matters. but. I think almost any financial planning that someone is providing to you, financial advice, has an eye to taxation. Uh, so why not have a show and a topic talking about uh, taxes a little more broadly? But you know, we do have a few uh, points in mind that we'd like to share uh, with the audience today. Uh, you know, as we were talking ahead of the show, we wanted to talk about some of the benefits that would be available to uh, to you as an employee. You know, what are some of those immediate tax deductions, savings? that you should be thinking about and utilizing in your uh, in your situation. You know, what's the one that stands out the most in your mind, Charlie, as you were to look at a client situation, let's say they're, uh, you know, a, well, they could be a client of any type, they're just simply employed and they've given you the PDF mm -hmm. handout from their employer, they've been open through open enrollment and here's all the benefits I have. You know, what are the ones that you're most looking into as you tear open that PDF? Sure, sure. And I just want to preface this before we begin that, Ben, we're going to try to make taxes fun today. It's not oh, okay. going to just be <laughs> a boring tax conversation, but taxes done the right way can be fun. So to answer your question, Ben, when I look and part of what I do is we look at the company benefit booklet during open enrollment, and we look at primarily insurance, but to Ben's question, one of the things that I like to see is that 401k. I think that's a softball um, base hit that you can easily do. And how it works with the 401k is anything that you put into a traditional 401k, which would be pre-tax or you don't get taxed on it now, will be a tax deduction, which is really cool. Now, what's neat about that is as it has a tax deduction now is that if you're making a lot of money now it's more valuable to you now but let's say you're not you're just starting out in your career and you aren't making that much then i look for the other option when it comes to a 401k that would be a roth 401k not every company has a roth 401k 
But if they do, then you can get the best of both worlds because a Roth means it's after tax. So you pay taxes now, but the nice thing about that is you never pay taxes in the future. So if you pay taxes now and you're not making a lot of money, and then as you go through your mid-career and late career, most likely you'll be making more than you're, you are now, you can actually have a lower tax bracket today and never have to pay for that those taxes again. So that's probably the first thing I look at, Ben, is the 401k. Are you l- utilizing it, not just for the company match, which is free money, but are you utilizing it in a tax efficient way? How much are you making now relative to how much will you be making in the future? And then also after retirement, then there can be some times where you're artificially not making money because you're retired. And then there's some neat things that you can do when it comes to moving stuff from a traditional 401k to a Roth 401k or IRA individual retirement account kind of is interchangeable when it comes to the taxes on each of them. They're different, but um, that's stuff that we look at when it comes to how to be tax efficient when it comes to your first, um, the first step of the benefits book in the 401k. Yeah, I think that's a good step off, Charlie. I, there's so many of those different types of plans too. So I mean, more broadly, we just refer to this as an employer retirement account. And depending on what type of employer you have and sure, the sure, code sure. section we're speaking of it with the IRS, you have a 401k, which is probably the most common, but there's 403Bs, 401As, 457Bs yes. and the like. I think New York has a 414H you know, for retirement contributions through the uh, em- employer retirement system. So there's a whole, you know, entourage of, of varieties of these. 401k is probably the most common uh, Correct. version. And, you know, if we're looking at ways to like, hey, I want to get my my tax liability down, potentially pre-tax uh, 401k contributions make sense. But as Charlie is bringing up, you know, what we need to be thinking about, especially as planners, and, and this could be really a difference of a tax advisor who's got a planning focus and looking ahead and not just the tax advisor who's doing your tax return and looking to get the biggest refund for you is that we want to be thinking about what's your current tax rate today and what's your current tax rate in in the future. Because uh, the, the whole question of doing pre-tax contributions or Roth contributions really hinges on what's the uh, what's the difference, you know, the delta, as we might call it, in the, the point of contribution versus the point of distribution. And, uh, you know, ironically enough, you might think that there's a huge advantage of one versus the other. Maybe pre-tax is considerably better because, hey, I'm getting a tax break. What's not to love? Or, hey, a Roth contribution, kind of the reverse of this, where you pay taxes now, but the money grows tax-free and you don't have to pay taxes again on it. Well, that sounds great. You know, if the money grows by a whole bunch, then I'm going to save you a whole bunch of taxes. You might think Roth is the better way to go. And uh, I think one of the things that I've learned over the course of my career, I once was really persuaded early on that the Roth was always the right way to go, no matter how much money you made. And there is a person out there who likes to promote this and even suggest you, would you rather pay taxes on the seed or pay taxes on the harvest? And as much as that is a compelling analogy, it's just not correct <laughs> for what takes place. Um, the The real difference between these really comes down to what's your current tax rate now at the point of contribution? What's your tax rate at the point of distribution? And surprising enough, the math is, is if the tax rates are the exact same, there really is no difference by and large. Now there is some variations and other considerations on that, but as a matter of taxes paid and how much income and wealth you have, contribution distribution stays uh, stays the same. So I think going back to you, Charlie, and what you were suggesting, mm-hmm. we could kick it back over. You know, which way to go with this? You know, what what are you thinking when you when you're working with someone to help lean you towards one direction or the other? What what do you find persuasive in a client situation to say, hey, you know, I think we should be doing pre-tax contributions, or hey, I think we should go Roth, or maybe maybe we split it. Like, what are some of the considerations going across in your mind? Yeah. So one of the things that I like to consider, and you hit the nail on the head there, Ben, was the tax brackets. So right now, since 2018, we've been under what's called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act tax law. So this tax law is slashed rates um, relative to 2017 and before, and really over the last 70 years, this is some of the lowest rates that we've seen. 
Now, we can't say that tax rates are going to go down in the future. They're going to go up in the future. They're going to be all over the board in the future because we just don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. Now, Ben, if I did, I'd blow that off and be like, all right, let's let's make sure that you guys are, we're planning for the perfect way we can. Hey, that so would be handy. That, if you had a crystal ball, I'd like, I, you know, I think you might be in another business, uh, Charlie. You know, a, a little <laughs> side note about that crystal ball, you know, with everyone trying to predict the market and everything, everyone's like, oh my gosh, I know where the market's coming. Come follow me. If there was somebody who truly knew how to predict the market, do you think he'd tell you his secrets and sell them to you? If it was me, I'd be in an island somewhere with all the money I could make off the market and just not tell a soul and be the richest person in the world. Um, that's just a side note. Um, I couldn't I couldn't agree anymore. Yeah, if somebody really knew what was going to happen to the market, you probably wouldn't be working for them. That's the honest truth, folks. Let's just <laughs> let's be honest. They they're probably not working. You know why why would they? You know why, why would what would be the reason to do for that? So continue exactly, on. No. exactly. But that's a little side note that I just thought of with the crystal ball. But anyway, since we don't have a crystal ball, <laughs> we do have to look at that we do know facts. And the fact is going to be that at the end of 2025, Congress is going to get the option to either extend the current tax system, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or it's going to sunset in 2026. The reason I bring this up is because this helps me determine where to go with a pre-tax, which means you don't pay taxes um, right now. You get a tax deduction on your W-2. And a little side note too, on your W-2, if you look at your W-2 in box one, that's the taxes you're going to pay um, that year. But box five is actually the money that you've made throughout the year. And they're going to be different if you contribute to a 401k. Um, so looking at then the tax rates, we know that tax rates are going to be lower and not and I say lower now is because we don't know, but judging from how Congress acts right now, and this is just a um, a conjecture that I've seen through Congress, especially now when they can't even agree on funding for anybody out in the world, they can't agree between themselves. Um, I don't know if they're going to be able to agree on extending all the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. They might extend some. Um, you know, there was some good stuff that that actually is no more like the increased child tax credit. Um, maybe they'll bring that back, which would be really helpful, especially for all the people with Catholic families, large Catholic families. Um, but right now, tax brackets are low. And another thing about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is that the actual brackets are much bigger. So what I mean by that is in the tax system, we don't pay taxes at whatever top bracket you're in. So what that means is, is that let's say you make, let's say you make $200,000 a year. Now I'm just going to preface this and say, these are not the real tax brackets um, because it could change if you're married filing jointly, married filing separately, single. So all of that consideration aside, I'm just going to use arbitrary tax brackets right now. The, um, so let's say you're in the 24% tax bracket making 200,000. Well, Back before 2017, there was actually different tax rates. So that would actually be a higher tax bracket, but also the amount of dollars in that bracket are going to be smaller before 2017. And what I mean by that is, let's say it was only a 50,000 difference between the 22% and the 24%. Then in 20, before that, it was only a, about a 25% thousand dollar difference now again this is just an example these aren't the real differences but yeah, i but do want to point out that the uh the brackets are much bigger now so what's neat about that is that if we know that we can actually maybe do um roth contributions because we know that if the tax cuts and jobs act sunsets you're going to be in a higher bracket later on and that could be is just two years away Right. I mean, we got to think of taxes. I think, Charlie, to, to echo that thought is, are they on sale or not? Or is this a good time to pay taxes? I mean, unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of folks who would like, you know, if they're working with an advisor or a good tax pro, they, they hope that they don't have to pay anything in taxes. And right, as right, much yeah. as I could, I could wave that magic wand. Maybe you've got crystal balls. I've got magic wands. You know, those are in short supply, too. 
like the truth is, is you, ultimately you pay in, the you pay taxes on income taxes, right? And so the more income you have, the more taxes you have. And it's not, you know, it's not really all that feasible to completely sidestep taxation on on income taxes. And that's not to say we couldn't uh, optimize or minimize or or be more efficient as we've been highlighting, but we can't completely sidestep it. Um, it you're you're going to get taxed, and so the question here is not to avoid taxes at all costs, uh, because maybe complete avoidance at this point in time actually is a more costly arrangement than going ahead and just accepting let's pay the taxes uh, today. And so to, to Charlie's right. point, I mean we've got lower tax rates right now under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, but the tax brackets themselves that have those lower tax rates are much broader and larger, and so more of your income is staying taxed at those lower tax rates. And so overall, this is some of the lowest taxation we have seen, you know, you know, in recent memory for sure. Uh, now to speculate as to what will come and change, you know, we, who knows? Uh, it doesn't seem likely that Congress will completely <laughs> in, in, uh, re, re-enable all these. Uh, the, the payoff, the reason why the Trump administration moved forward with this was with the hopes that it would spur such economic activity that even though we were getting a deal tax-wise overall, the the IRS coffers would fill up even more uh, because of increased uh, economic activity. Well, I, I think the jury maybe remains out to be seen there. I don't, I'm sure. not an expert and can speak to such matters. But the reality is, is, you know, we've taken on quite a bit of debt as a country. I doubt we're going to continue to see as good of a deal as we're getting. And so that's what this comes down to is what kind of deal are you getting? Is now a good time to go and pay your taxes or should we wait for an even better deal? I think you're getting a pretty good deal right now, and I can't uh, I can't really disagree with your 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 sentiment uh, or a sentiment, uh, Charlie. Uh, that said, though, I mean, if you ca- if someone came to you in the highest tax rate that that there is, thirty seven percent, would you still be inclined to go with all uh, Roth contributions? Would would you do some pre tax? What would be your take on let's say the highest of tax rates versus lowest of tax rates on this question of the employer retirement account? Yeah, it's a good question. So. What we have to look at is your current tax rates versus your future tax rates, as Ben alluded to. So we know that there will be a time when you retire before you take Social Security that you have much more flexibility on how what those numbers look like on your 1040, on your individual in, income tax return. Now there's, and this is where working with a, a planner who understands the nuances with taxes is really important because there's three major different accounts. There's a Roth account, there's or a Roth IRA, a Roth 401k, there's a 401k account or an IRA. Those are, are taxed beforehand, Roth is taxed uh, after. And then in the middle, there's an individual or a joint brokerage account which is taxed medium. It's about 15% right now, and that's called capital gains tax. That's for long term. So when you retire, then you can determine, okay, where do I want the money coming from to fund my expenses? And you have options. So if I have someone coming to me in the top tax rate right now, I know later on down the line, all things being considered, and we don't have control, like we alluded to, over tax law, But all things being considered with today's tax system, it makes sense, I think in my mind, that I would give people the advice of max out your 401, your traditional 401k, because you're getting the biggest bang for your buck. Not only the 37%, but I live in Illinois. So there's another 5% kicker on top of that. So that's over 40% tax savings just by contributing to a traditional 401k versus you're effectively paying 41%, um, sorry, 42% if you don't do a uh, pre-tax 401k and you end up doing a Roth 401k. And when I say 401k, I do mean an employer qualified account. So that could be a 457, that could be a 403b, et cetera. But like Ben said, the 401k is the uh, most prevalent, prevalent account out there. But I think with that said, I mean, and Charlie, I would completely agree. By and large, if you're in the top, top tax rate right now, it's not likely that when you get into retirement, you're going to stay at the top tax rate. We tend to see, this isn't guaranteed. It really depends on how wealthy you are. I mean, it's possible that you'd stay in the top tax rate your entire life, even into retirement, because you just have so much wealth. 
But for most people, there tends to be, you know, it's nice. a, a good problem to have, right? Yeah, so, but for most people, there's a shifting down where, yeah, maybe I'm a, a top earner now, top tax rates now, but retirement probably won't be quite as rich and full and I won't be able to recreate quite as much income. And so there's going to be a, a general shifting down. How much that shift is really depends on, you know, how much are you saving and, and accumulating uh, today? And, you know, what are your retirement needs? into the future. I mean, that shifting down could be very significant. I mean, part of the whole FI movement, if you're familiar with that financial independence movement, mm -hmm. is to take, you know, these top uh, tax earners, shove as much as we possibly can into tax breaks today, because we don't want to pay any taxes, and then transition into a lifestyle, usually a, like fierce frugality, and pushing your income down to next to nothing. I mean, the amazing thing about our tax code is like the first 70 some thousand of income it's largely non-taxed. I mean, it, it's not quite 70,000, but it's really low. And so now if you're willing, the challenge in all this is you could be a really high income earner and then you shift down to a lifestyle in which you're living on next to nothing. But by doing that, you could potentially, when you go to shift, if you pull that off, this is again what the FI movement's all about, you you keep all that money from getting taxed, period, because you can keep a lot of that uh, from being taxed because the first lower rates are so so forgiving. Uh, you know, between the standard deduction and the like. So there is, uh, you know, that that can be a strategy. Not too many people utilize it though, for the maybe the obvious reason that most people aren't up for having such a drastic shift in lifestyle from being a high income earner to now next to nothing. Uh, sure. But there's probably still something of a shift, uh, the point being, uh, point being. And so, yeah, uh, let's do, let's do pre-tax. But let's talk about this a little bit, Charlie, and then maybe we can move into some other employee benefits. I mean, would you do all all pre-tax? What are your thoughts on like required minimum distributions later on and, and the potential problem that that might cause, you know, let's say sure, in your early sure. 70s? No, that, that's, a, that's a smart uh, question. But before you go into that question, um, I do want to say when it comes to the FIRE movement, what you were saying, or the, the financial independent, the first FI, is that, and Ben, you and I were talking about this, is that a lot of people say, how do I pay the least amount in tax? Well, it is make less money. You know, <laughs> yeah, the government's right. going to get his his dues. So when it comes to that, if you do want that drastic change in lifestyle, you can do it and you can say, I'm not going to make as much. But remember, you got to do that drastic change in lifestyle. Yeah. It's much easier said than done when you're spending, let's say, $100,000 a year and then you go to cutting that in half. It's yeah. a lot easier said than the, that a lot easier said than done than actually to do it. So, right. I mean, it saves you love the tax savings, but I don't know. Uh, you know, it's you have to be almost an accountant's heart or a nerd of sorts to really get behind the numbers along because most people just don't love the savings that much. They'd rather just pay the taxes and have right, more, right. have more income. <laughs> right. You're gonna have to take so. a lot less pictures on your Instagram account about going out to eat and seeing like a nice a nice dinner in front of you. So. <laughs> For sure. But still, I mean, pre-tax can't be the whole solution for somebody, even if you're a high income earner, or, or we wouldn't want it to be your only bucket because uh, the issue that I will kick it back over to you to, to address is, you know, required minimum just distribution. Yeah. You know, what, what happens there, uh, Charlie, on the backside of those pre-tax deductions? Yeah. So with the required minimum distributions, let's say you are a good saver and you're putting all your, you're maxing out your traditional 401k or employee qualified plan every year and you get this nice huge account well guess what now you're getting older and the rmd age is coming up and you're like oh my gosh what am i going to do you're going to get a big tax hit because what's going to happen is the government requires you to take money out of your account based on your age until at a certain age until you die now the age has been creeping up you know with the new secure act 2.0 the age for most of us is going to be 75 unless, um, you know, they change it again. So at 75, for the majority of people speaking, there there is caveats that it could be lower. But for the majority of people listening, it's going to be 75. Um, and then we're required to take out the distributions. And it's based on that balance, too. So if you have a huge balance in there, the government is going to force you to pay taxes on it. And what the shame is, it could put you into a higher tax bracket, especially if you're getting social security and it's making social security taxable at a higher rate. Um, now, when I say rate, more of it is taxable. It's not going to be taxed at a higher uh, percentage, uh, you know, a tax bracket, but more of it's going to be taxed, which could put you up into a higher tax bracket 
uh, even more. So you really got to manage those RMDs. And what's really neat about those years when you are retired and before you start taking Social Security is you could start to pull money into your tax return and put it into a Roth because if it's in a Roth, then there that's not calculated with RMDs. So you could actually make your RMDs smaller for the rest of your life and really do that tax management over the long term, which is really neat. Yeah, I mean, and what Charlie's alluding to there, folks, uh, just so that where everyone's following is, you know, typically we would see maybe a drop in income after you retire, but before Social Security kicks in and definitely before the RMDs kick in. And so you might have some low tax years then in which we can take potentially some of this pre-tax money that you've earned and eventually will turn into an issue later on if we let it to be where we get too much RMDs coming in. And whether you wanted to or not, you're actually not, you're not getting as good of a deal on your tax rate because now you've got all these RMDs hidden. We can shift that into those lower tax years and get, you know, use those to be the time in which we get the tax best tax deal that we can. But I mean, that doesn't necessarily have to happen in between, you know, after you retire into the la latter years of your life. It could just happen any year in which maybe you have a low income year as a household for whatever reason. Right. Uh, maybe let's say you start a business. Right. Yeah. Or a, a, a job change uh, for sure could take place. Or maybe there's just some challenges at home and there's a, a reason for you to pull back on income. Perhaps you're having kids. Uh, there's a whole number of reasons where your income may contract uh, for a, a period of time in which, you know, if we're being thoughtful and savvy, we can try to get some of those pre-tax dollars converted over to Roth and take right. advantage of the of the good deal that we're getting. And actually, Ben, real quick about the job change that made me, and we were talking about this earlier, is when it comes to a job change, the W-4, um, and I want to bring that up because when you get to a new job, a W-4 is the form that you're going to fill out to say what is your withholding. One thing that I've seen with clients on the W-4, especially when they go to a new job, and what I like to do is give a W-4 analysis, is that the W with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they changed the W-4 too. You know, it was so simple. Zero, one, two, three, exemptions. You know, it's great. Simple. Everyone, if you want a refund, you put zero. If the old system, if you don't yeah. want a refund, put three, you know, uh, you might have to, oh, but now with the new system, they've done away with the majority of exemptions and now it's more credits for children instead of exemptions. So the reason I bring this up is because if you get a new job, really look at your W-4 and the IRS has a W-4 calculator that I would encourage people to use to estimate your W-4. Because what happens is, is that especially if you get a job later in the year, they're only going to take out the income that you've made for that year in that job. So let's say you made a job making $100,000 before you even got this new job. In this new job, you're only making thirty. dollars Well, they're only going to withhold on the 30000 But when you have to report your taxes, you have to report that whole $130,000. So you better hope that $100,000 job before was over withholding, or you might have to be paying Uncle Sam some some money when it comes to April 15th. Yeah, Charlie, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because this is one of the things that we just see so often. And, and before I, I, I follow up with your thought, you know, I, we haven't done much folks to really plug Catholic Financial Planners Network. I just want to say a few words on that if I, if yeah, I can. Yeah, totally. Look, I mean, hopefully you guys are enjoying the conversation on taxes and the like, but be sure if you, uh, if you haven't checked out the advisors uh, on the Catholic Financial Planners Network, uh, please take a moment and do so. We're growing uh, by a few advisors every month at this point in time. More and more Catholic uh, uh, folks are, are are reaching out, both clients, uh, you know, prospective clients, people interested in services, but also uh, you know future uh, advisors. So all I can do is encourage you to spread the word. You know, check out the advisors, but you know, let your friends and family know about it. Know if you have any friends who are a financial advisor who don't know about the network, by all means, let's say something to them. Uh, you know, we're really building something pretty amazing there, but. Um, can I talk yeah. on that too? Yeah, okay, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, just real quick. So Ben and I are both members and it is a fantastic network. And if you're an advisor, we host a monthly study group call and we'd love to see you on there. We host a variety of op of topics and we just had a um, investment advisor who does strictly Catholic investing and it was a great conversation. And you'd be surprised of how many um, Catholic investments actually have anti-Catholic things mm -hmm. that they support. So it was a very, very great conversation. So do check us out, uh, Catholic Financial Planners Network. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks for that, Charlie. Well, you know, to speak, a lot of times people will sometimes ask, you know, like, oh man, you know, I got a huge refund. You're you're a genius. You know, I love what the work you're doing for me. Or golly, I owe so much. I've never owed this much in my life. I don't know what you're doing. I mean, my other guy never had me owe. Um, and I, to the point that Charlie just made on that W four, look, you know, there's there is certainly work to be done, and how well a, a tax form is prepared, and whether or not everything has been applied to you may or may not be taking case. Uh, hopefully, you're working with a, an advisor. Uh, you can work with us. And we're going to make sure we get all all that work done for you. Uh, but, you know, we're we're giving you the best tax deal we can in the scope of the law. But by and large, the main reason why someone gets a big refund or owes has a lot to do with just simply how much did you set aside in taxes through payroll and withholding. And especially for those folks who owe, and it's a big surprise. It's like what you know, it, their W four just was off. Maybe just exactly as Charlie was illustrating, there was a change in job, and the next employer only withheld enough for what was a relatively small amount of income for that year. And there wasn't enough being set aside in conjunction with all the income streams and sources that you have. So when we actually go to put everything on the tax return, we find out that you hadn't set aside enough and now maybe owe five or 10 or even $15,000 more. I mean, I've had some, oh, quite a bit. I don't know if what you've seen, Charlie. And thankfully, we were expecting or knowing it and we were, you know, we had the money there. We were just trying to keep it out of the government's hands for as long as possible. But uh, sure, sure. <laughs> You know, I, well, what's, I mean, what, what's the biggest surprise? I just want to throw it out there. What, what's the biggest surprise you've seen maybe on a tax return? Like, yeah, oh, so I saw the biggest some surprise. And, and just to give us a preface, this is that as planners, what we do is make sure they have emergency funds too. Emergency funds are paramount for the unexpected. So we were covered here, but the biggest, um, I had a client who has a sizable income and she changed jobs and usually... When you get to those higher brackets, the W-4 kind of works itself out because you're making so much money. But the way the W-4 worked out um, and the way that the paychecks worked out, she ended up owing about $35,000. Yeah, and there you go. It's, a, it's a not a fun, it's never fun to do that, you know, to owe, even with the emergency fund. Um, no, we had, a, we had a client more recently here in which we kind of thought it was going to be 30 to 35. And when we found out that she had sold some stock that we were unaware of with significant gains, <laughs> and it went from 30 to 35 vote to it was 50 to 55. It was like, oh, golly, that's not what we yeah. were planning for. <laughs> well, and then also speaking of um, of gains, that's like another thing that you can think about when it comes to taxes too, is maybe not sell it and use a, uh, a fund called a donor advised fund which is below the line when it comes yeah. to taxes. And below the line is a little tax speak to say it's in um, below adjusted gross income, which is a, a worse deduction than above the line deductions. Um, but conversely, if you're old enough, you could do what's called a qualified charitable distribution, which is not even, it doesn't even That's show tough. up on your taxes. But here's what's so cool about working with an advisor who understands the taxes is that when you, hit you a QCD, you're going to get a tax form called a 1099-R. Nowhere on the 1099-R does it say that you did a QCD. So if the advisor doesn't tell the CPA or whoever's preparing the taxes that you've done a QCD, you can give the money to charity and never get a deduction and pay taxes on what you gave to charity. So that's where it's really important that if you're working with an advisor, that they have a great relationship with the CPA or you work with an advisor who also prepares taxes so they can see the whole picture um, in one place. And that doesn't go through the cracks. Yeah, Charlie, let's just end with with that because I, we were hoping folks to get into some other subject matters like employee it's, benefits yeah. of dependent care FSA and a HSA and a healthcare FSA and just all these other potential pre-tax employee benefits. But I think we'll leave it with em employer retirement accounts. But perhaps let's just l leave with this notion too of just the importance of making sure that either your advisor is uh, equally equipped and, and knowledgeable as to what's happening tax wise, or at minimally, they are working hand in hand with the tax advisor because they can be done separately as two different professions and uh, professionals. And I think that can be fine, but there needs to be close communication just to Charlie's point here, because what's happened in your situation as it comes over in tax documents is not always super obvious to the one who's preparing your tax return. Those documents aren't super clear. And even with a, a robust questionnaire uh, that are trying to feel out and get a sense as to what took place and make the advisor, the tax advisor, the tax professional up to speed as to what took place, things can get missed. And it, sure. you know, 
a tax document, again, can only share so much. So, you know, if something like a QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution, took place, uh, that needs to get passed on to uh, from the advisor to the tax professional. You know, another instance um, in which this comes up where we see people really unfortunately pay more in taxes than what they need to. And thankfully, these things can be fixed. If we catch it soon enough, we can just amend the tax return and, and get it corrected. But, you know, there's only so much time that's allowable. So we can't perm can't always go back and fix it. Mm -hmm. But back to it, Ross, why don't you talk a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, why don't you talk about that a little bit, Charlie? What are some of the instances if someone's pursuing what's called a backdoor Roth strategy in which, uh, you know, unfortunately they may owe or pay more in taxes than what they need to. Yeah. So with the backdoor Roth, uh, it, the backdoor Roth, just to give it a little preface here, is all over the internet. Oh, let's do a backdoor Roth. It's so great and everything. It can be great, but then it goes back to the conversation of how much you're making right now versus later. Um, but when it comes to the backdoor Roth, the biggest issues that I see is what's called the pro rata rule. Um, so someone might have a open up a um, what's called a after tax IRA and move the money to a Roth account. And then what happens is they end up paying some taxes on it because how the IRS rules apply is that you actually aggregate or you add up all your IRAs, not just the one you're using for your backdoor Roth to say, is it going to be taxable? So I see that, that there are people think it's going to be, um, you know, before we work with them, obviously, um, people think it's going to be tax free, but it's not. Um, so that's one of the big things that I see. What about you, Ben? Have you had experience there? Well, I'm, we've seen it with the pro router rule, but I mean, ten, thankfully with the clients that we're, we've been working with, that tends not to be an issue. That's already been worked out. Right. But where I have right. seen it, you know, uh, you know, to each their own in terms of who they choose to work with on for tax purposes. But, you know, there's software solutions, retail solutions out there that are intended to, you know, do your own taxes. You don't Make need someone easy. else to do it for, you know, we've got, you know, we you don't need a professional. This is super easy. Just answer the questions and the software is supposed to kind of fill in the gaps and figure it all out. And I just wish that was true. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, I think to some level, maybe on a very basic return, you're fine with those sort of solutions. But Golly, folks, I mean, if you're making quite a bit of money, you're in the 35 or 37% tax bracket, any mistakes you start to make on your tax return start to be pretty expensive uh, uh, mistakes, you know, go up by all means and hire a tax professional out. Because right. in the backdoor Roth in particular, even with done by other professionals at times, if they're not familiar with it, this is another instance in which the tax documents don't always say clearly what's taking place. And so, and if you don't know better to ask and follow up or to get clarity on it, you know, the 1099 R's here can look as they're stated that that Roth conversion is a taxable event. Most times, Roth and it, it, it does look like that. It does. It does look like that. And so I've seen, you know, see, you know, other professionals, CPAs included. You know, I mean, just anybody. We all make mistakes, right? But they, you know, someone converted twenty four thousand, intending for it to be back to a Roth. They don't understand the tax documents or the tax forms. You know, that gets back to them, and it's like, oh yeah, I suppose that looks right. And all, all that to say is, they, I don't know. I, I, the worst I've seen it was where someone had a backdoor Roth, the 24,000, all of it should have been non-taxable. They ended up paying taxes on all of it. They were on a high tax rate of like 35%. We're talking like an $8,000 tax oopsie, you know, on their, on their filing. Um, you know, thankfully it was caught early enough that it was able to get fixed, but I think there's plenty of people out there, especially higher income earners who don't, these mistakes don't get caught and they're not aware of it. And yeah. again, the tax documents don't scream to you and tell you exactly what's going on. You need to have someone who's familiar enough with what what you may be doing to be able to pick up on the clues. It's really clues right, right. that are coming home to you. So, anyhow, and, and on that note, go ben, ahead, Charlie. Yeah. I would say that it's important to do what you're going to do with the backdoor Roth, but actually understand the tax documents so you can say, okay, this is how it should be versus, uh -huh. oh, I don't know, we'll just talk to the CPA and figure it out because a CPA might not know what's going on. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Yeah. If that were to just be anything that we're trying to communicate with you folks today, it's, it's really important to have an advisor who's knowledgeable in taxes or minimally at least is working very closely with an advisor, uh, with a, a tax professional, a CPA or a, an enrolled agent uh, who knows taxes in and out because uh, things uh, can flip through. And I mean, the whole point of this is to minimize your taxes but uh, you know, where all the rubber hits the road, so to say, is on that tax form. And if the tax form uh, gets it reported incorrectly, then that tax savings isn't actually getting realized or had. Uh, and 
you know, it was just an idea. It was a nice idea. Uh, and boy, that qualified charitable distribution and then back to our roster are probably two big instances in which it's pretty easy for that mistake to happen, even with a knowledgeable person, if they aren't staying as informed through a collaborative effort, uh, you know, between the advisor, financial advisor and the tax professional. So boy, I hope and I everyone- I would also say Ben- Oh, uh, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, real quick. I know we're, we're short on time here, but I will say too, is that when it gets to using the electronic softwares out there to prepare your own taxes, that area gets really complicated really fast. And some of the questions out there are very convoluted if you're not seasoned with taxes. Oh yeah, they're just, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not here to naysay on anybody, but I, you know, we work with some pretty intelligent people, high income earners you know, advanced degrees, you know, it's not a matter of intelligence, you know, they've, they've proven themselves to have uh, some wits about them. Uh, and they just get this stuff wrong, because it's just not their field. And they, they misunderstand it, and it, they get confused. And, you know, this stuff is just easily confused. I, I think that's just the, the takeaway. I mean, as intelligent as you are, don't underestimate your ability to misunderstand. Gosh, I've been doing this for over a decade now, and I still misunderstand tax statements, right? I mean, this is not, this stuff is just not always the easiest to pull together and make sure that it's, whether it applies in your situation or not, or what we need to do to make sure that it applies. Like it, misunderstandings, let's just say, abound. Um, so, well, good. Well, Charlie, thanks so much for coming on. I love taxes. It's great to talk about them. You know, we have a whole bunch of tax work that we do year, each year, uh, year in and year out. Um, it is, uh, I think it's a love hate relationship for me. I mean, I, I do love them, but man, sometimes, <laughs> you know, when it's, you're going through the thick of tax season, you're like, oh, this is not the most enjoyable, but you know, the, the benefit that we can deliver to the client uh, is really meaningful. And, and to have, for me to have just a client situation and as good of a situation as we can have it, I find, I know I just find a lot of satisfaction uh, with that. So uh, any closing comments or thoughts for you, Charlie? Uh, I think the closing comment for me is that taxes are one of the biggest pieces of not only of your financial picture of your whole life and the government's always going to want their money. And if you are smart about it, give the least amount to the government, not just in one year, but over your lifetime and work with someone who can help you do that. If you if you feel called to, because they can really help you save not only today, but for the rest of your life. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Can't do better than that. So folks, uh, be sure to check out Charlie uh, at his web profile, Catholic Financial Advisors or Catholic Financial Planners uh, Network.com. And then, uh, you know, take a look at our advisors. And, and then lastly, just keep listening to this podcast. We love producing this. Hope you guys are getting good value. If you've gotten any feedback or thoughts or ideas for us, by all means, reach out and let us know. Uh, but uh, we'll just keep putting out good ton content. So between now and next time, God's blessings to you. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ben.